And um, I am really, really blown away by the energy at this festival, at this workshop. I, I think this is incredible. Miles, I, this is 10 years? This is, this is amazing. Susan and Lorraine and all the interns and everybody. Um, I can't wait for the rest of the week. Well, I guess what I mean is I can't wait until this part of it is done and I get to listen to Morris and <laughs> Patricia. Um, and I'm so delighted to hear Morris and Patricia. What a, what a blast to hear them. But first I have to do this part <laughs> before I get to enjoy it the rest. So um, Nicole mentioned my kids, but this is really, I, I have very few kid-friendly poems. So I hope there are no children in the audience because it's not really that appropriate for them. Or maybe it would be, like for a mature kid. I'm going to read from um, a couple from e each of my three books and then a couple of brand new ones. But first I'll start with a, a poem called Artless. Artless is my heart, a stranger berry there never was, tartless, gone sour in the sun, in the sunroom or moonroof, roofless, no poetry, plain, no fresh special recipe to bless. All I've ever made with these hands in life, less substance, more rind, mostly rim and trim, meatless, but making much smoke in the old smokehouse, no less. Fatted from the day, overripe and even toxic at eve. Nonetheless, in the end, if you must know, if I must bend, wasteless to that excruciation. No marvel, no harvest left me speechless. Yet I find myself somehow with heart, aloneless. With heart, fighting fire with fire, flightless, that loud hub of us, meat stub of us, beating us senseless. <clears throat> Spectacular in its way, its way of not seeing, congealing dayless, but in everydayness. In that hopeful haunting, a lesser way of saying in darkness, there is silencelessness for the pressing question. Heart, what art you? War, star, part? Or less, playing apart, staying apart from the one who loves, loveless. And um, I have a new poem, a, a new poem coming out um, in, in the New Yorker in a few months. So this is that, and it's um, called I Have a Time Machine. I have a time machine. But unfortunately, it can only travel into the future at a rate of one second per second, which seems <laughs> slow to the physicists and to the grant committees and even to me. But I managed to get there time after time to the next moment and to the next. Thing is, I can't turn it off. I keep zipping ahead while well, not zipping. And if I try to get out of this time machine, open the latch, I'll fall into space unconscious, then desiccated. And I'm pretty sure I'm afraid of that, so I stay inside. There's a window, though. It shows the past. It's like a television or fish tank, but it's never live. It's always over. The fish swim in backward circles. Sometimes it's like a rearview mirror, another chance to see what I'm leaving behind. And sometimes like blackout, all that time wasted sleeping, myself, Age eight, whole head burnt with embarrassment at having lost a library book. Myself, lurking in a candled corner, expecting to be found charming. Me, holding a rose, though I want to put it down so I can smoke. Me, exploding at my mother, who explodes at me, because the explosion of some dark star all the way back struck hard at mother's mother's mother. I turn away from the window, anticipating a blow. I thought I'd find myself an old woman by now, traveling so light in time. But I haven't gotten far at all. Strange not to be able to pick up the pace as I'd like. The past is so horribly fast. 
Um, let's lighten it a little bit. Time and death and your mom. I'm over the moon. So I was um, looking at tarot cards, which is always a terrible mistake for inspiration for poems. Um, it doesn't yield anything but, uh, well, um, an attempt at a reading of, of an archetype. An archetype, so it ends up being a little bit too overblown or too easy or something. Anyway, I kept cheating. You can't do that either because the tarot gets mad at you if you keep picking cards until you get what you like. Um, <laughs> so I keep picking up justice and strength and things that I just didn't want to write about because just thought, how am I going to write about strength? You know, the strong are. I mean, it just seemed too too abstract. So I finally got the moon, and I thought, oh, my old friend, the moon, right? A poet's love the moon, and we know what the moon is. The moon is sexy and romantic, and, um, but then you look at the little, the little cheat sheet in your tarot deck, and it says what the moon card actually means, and it actually means betrayal, disillusionment, deceit. <laughs> it's not the romantic symbol we all thought it was. It's actually a big lie. So this poem's called I'm Over the Moon. I don't like what the moon is supposed to do. Confuse me, ovulate me, spoon feed me longing. A kind of ancient date rape drug. So I'll howl at you, moon, I'm angry. I'll take back the night. Using me to swoon at your questionable light. You had me chasing you, the world's worst lover, over and over, hoping for a mirror, a whisper, insight. But you disappear for nights on end with all my erotic mysteries and my entire unconscious mind. How long do I try to get water from a stone? It's like having a bad boyfriend in a good band. <laughs> You're better off alone. I'm going to write hard and fast into you, moon, face fucking something you wouldn't understand. You with no swampy sexual promise but what we glue onto you. That's not real. You have no begging cunt, no panties ripped off and the crotch sucked, no lacerating spasms sending electrical sparks through the toes. Stars have those. What do you have? You're a tool, Moon. Now, Noon, there's a hero. The obvious sun, no bullshit. The enemy of poets and lovers, sleepers and creatures. My lovers have never been able to read my mind. I've had to learn to be direct. It's hard to learn that, hard to do. The sun is worth 10 of you. You don't hold a candle to that complexity, that solid craze, like an animal carcass on the road at night picked out by crows, haunting walkers and drivers, your face regularly sliced up by the moving frames of car windows. Your light is drawn, quartered, your dreams are stolen. You change shape and turn away, letting night solve all night's problems alone. So I have, I have one sister She's a total pain in the butt. You know, but she's all I have. So, talking to her on the phone is frustrating because I always wanted to call up another sister and have a better conversation. <laughs> talk about stuff I want to talk about. This poem's called I Wish I Had More Sisters. I wish I had more sisters, enough to fight with and still have plenty more to confess to embellishing the fight so that I look like I'm right, and then turn all my sisters one by one against my sister. <laughs> one sister will be so bad, the rest of us will have a purpose in bringing her back to where it's good with us, and we'll feel useful, and she'll feel loved. Then another sister will have a tragedy, and again, we will unite in our grief, judging her much less than we did the bad sister. This time, it wasn't our sister's fault. This time, it could have happened to any of us, and in a way, it did. We'll know she wasn't the only sister to suffer. We all suffer with our choices, and we all have our choice of sisters. My sisters will seem like a bunch of alternate me, all of the ways I could have gone. I could see how things pan out without having to do the things myself. The abortions, the divorces, the arson, swindles, poison jelly. But who could say they weren't myself? We're so close. I mean, who can tell the difference? 
I would choose to be, I could choose to be a fisherman's wife since I'd be able to visit my sister in her mansion, sipping bubbly for once, braying to the others who weren't invited. I could be a traveler, a seer, a poet, a potter, a fly swatter. None of those choices would be as desperate as they seem now. My life would be like one finger on a hand, a beautiful, usable, <laughs> ringed, rung, piano and dishpan hand. There would be both more and less of me to have to bear. None of us would be forced to be stronger than we could be. Each of us could be all of us, the pretty one, the smart one, the bitter one, the unaccountably happy for no reason one. <laughs> I could be, for example, the hopeless one. And the next day my sister would take my place and I would hold her up until my arms gave way and another sister would relieve me. So I, people, um, I, I've gotten some really lovely letters from people about that poem and a lot of them made me think, a lot, a lot of stories, you know, oh, you wouldn't believe my sister, or how did you know about my sisters? And <laughs> someone said that it was exactly like her family and she had five sisters and they all did the stuff that I described and I was like, I totally made up the poison jelly part. I can't imagine <laughs> how you, what you did with that. It's from, it's from like olden times, you know? <laughs> so, um, but I also it made me realize that I think this is a, a topic that is very under-discussed, the, the relation between sisters because there's something about it. There's something competitive, something loving, something sort of uh, necessary. I, I don't think people are talking about it because I got a lot of a lot of letters who really who really made it made me think that they thought I was the only person that they'd ever you know seen write about it. It was very odd. So maybe we should talk about um, sisters. I guess that's what I was just doing. Um, let's move on. In this economy, loathed phrase, in this economy, the economical ikebana of the lesser octopus is disarming, a sextopus, holding its intelligence and ink in a concentrate. Not some sloppy octopus who suddenly freaks, so princessy, rich, driven to abstraction, not unlike flowers dropping their petals because petals are garbage off the bloom. Not expensive anymore, that's going inside to find meaning. Cut the eyes then from the cruel ikebana of the racehorse. If a leg breaks, she can't bear her own weight. Long blossomed head turns to glue and the fortune zooms off like flies from a carcass when shooed. The tripod fell so I had to cast about for my crutch to walk over my bad left knee, buckling, to write it. I want to take a picture of the flowers I arranged after an Ikebana class, just one. I quit quickly, but still hope to learn to arrange beauty classically. Maybe I'm lazy, or don't apply the rules to myself. Or maybe laze is just zeal rearranged, as in my case. Even now, the clock we need to punch out on is too far away to plug in, so power collects in its hands. This is a poem from, from my first book. Called Dear Ganglia. Dear Ganglia. The most inscrutable, beautiful names in this world always do sound like diseases. <laughs> it's because they are engorged. Gee, I am a fool. What we feel in the solar plexus wrecks us. Halfway squatting on a crate where feeling happened, caresses. You know, corporeal gifts besmirch thieves like me. But she plucks a feather and my steam escapes. We're awake each night at Penny Moon, and we micro and necro. I can't stop. But love and what all, the uncomfortable position of telling the truth, like the lotus, can't be held long. If she knew, would she just take all her favors from my marmalade vessel and chuck them back into the endless reversible garment which is my life? An astonishing vanishing. Gee, I know this letter is like a slice of elevator accident. As smart folk would say, everything is only nothing's truck. 
I would revise it and say that everything is only nothing truncated. Love your Igor. My, my three-year-old always says, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever. And I'm always like, there's more after never? <laughs> it just seems like never is supposed to cut it. Right? And what does never mean? <laughs> never, ever. Alarmed. Today is a new dawn. And that affair recurs daily like clockwork, undone at dusk, when a new restaurant emerges in the malnourished night. We said it would be this way once this became the way it was. So in a way, we were waiting for it. I still haven't eaten, says the cook in the kitchen, a compliant complaint. I never eat, says the slender diner. It's slander, and she's scared, like a bully pushing lettuce around. The cook can't look, blind with hunger and anger. I told a waiter to wait for me, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> oh, it has been 40 minutes, it has been 40 years. Late is a synonym for dead, which is a euphemism for ever. Ever is a double-edged word, and once itself and its own opposite. Always and always some other time. In the category of cleave, then, to cut and to cling to somewhat mournfully, that C won't let leave alone. Even so, forever's now's never, and remember is just the future occluded or dreaming. The day has come, a dusty gust of disgusting August, functioning as a people mover. Maybe we're going nowhere, but wherever I go, I see us everywhere. On occasions of fanciness or out to eat. As if people, stark, nowish people, themselves were the forever of nothing, the, no the everything of nobody, the very same self of us all, after all, at last the first. So you know how there are all these new, um, new vocations? You know, like, we're not writers, we're content providers, and you know, all these weird things, these, these new ways of um, describing the, 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 the new fangled, invented, made up uh, stuff we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I, I think that the more people go along, I think we should have something called a, um, a book shrink. <laughs> like a psychiatrist you go to to help you write your book, you just lie on the couch and you just talk about it's just so hard, you know, starting a chapter or whatever you have to do. <laughs> I have a problem with endings. I've always had a problem with endings. <laughs> At the book shrink. At the book shrink, one learns to say, my body uses me as a grape uses wine. To talk about inevitability, the essence of plot. But what happens when a person understands she is being sent back glass by glass, to the invisible pouring stations of the larger narrative, that she is merely like or likely a person in a book, like a saltwater balloon sinking in the ocean, like a person in a book, like I said already, someone's not listening, someone's eating breakfast or falling asleep or texting a married lover, as shrinks are wont to do. If I am boring, then at least I am getting somewhere, through the wood I knock on. My story is telling, but it is not telling me. I need help getting to the next part. When I open my mouth, liquid rushes in and drunkening. When I close it, dark, secret-looking drops spill crimson on the page. So I thought, don't you love in your, in your writing to sort of use little snippets of other people's bio, bio, autobiographies? I had a friend who was complaining that his shrink would eat breakfast during his session. It really bothered him. 
So he's trying to figure out how to tell him not to eat breakfast on his time. And so this is my time. How can you eat your breakfast? Um, and then a, the same person had a shrink fall asleep on him <laughs> repeatedly. And I just thought that was so, I just felt like, I've got to use that in a poem. <laughs> it's okay, right? You can use other people's, other people's details. He wasn't using him. <laughs> all possible pain. Because I figured if I just put all possible pain in the title, it would just round it all up and put it in one place. It wouldn't just seep into everything. All possible pain. Feelings seem like made up things, though I know they're not. I don't understand why they lead me around, why I can't explain to the cop how the pot got in my car, how my relationship with God resembled that of a prisoner and firing squad, and how I felt after I was shot. Because then the way I felt was feelingless. I had no further problems with authority. I was free from the sharp tongue of the boot of life, from its scuffed leather toe, my heart broken like a green bottle in a parking lot, my life a parking lot, 98 degrees in the shade, but there is no shade, never even a sliver. What if all possible pain was only the grief of truth, the throb lingering only in the exit wounds, though the entries were the ones that couldn't close, as if either of those was the most real of an assortment of realities, existing, documented, hanging like the sentenced under one sky's roof. But my feelings, well, they had no such proof. If words were material and not ether, ink, rivulet of breath in space, they'd have a hand-stitched quality, each a star splat of sleep or love on a plain white tight cotton sheet. Words, the berries of the cosmos, plucked from their system for my mere mouth moment and changed beyond belief because you don't believe me. Can you hear those blues oozing where the rasps scrape from bush and bramble to the throat? Sing like changeling starlings on the line of verse or vine of voice so fine it might wing off to be spoken into broken air. When tune or tone is total truth, it is, isn't it? Those of us can hear it can't translate, blinded by the everglow of swallowed night among the speechless. Um, this happens almost at the end of a reading where I'm trying to find, figure out why I didn't put more funny stuff. <laughs> you know? Um, I think the word put is really funny. I had a, I had a student, um, it was a Princeton undergrad, and his title made no sense. It was a beautiful poem and his title made no sense. I said, what, what's up with the title? And he goes, oh, I just put that. <laughs> he just put that? You just put it? Well, I just put that. It's so funny, it's so weirdly passive, right? Uh, why didn't I put, put more, where are the funny poems? Where did I put them? All right, first date, first date and still very, very lonely. A pleasant leather poison is the trick to smelling good to female saddles. That is, saddles with a hole and not a pommel. Remember those? Gone the way of vestal virgins and tight white black holy hell, and with it, the lesbian Elysium of old. I miss the idea of wives, the loving circle, but onward. Today is a sacred day, a date day. An exception to the usual poor me, poor me. I'm not poor, I'm not me. I remember both states as soon ago as last week. But that's history, this is different. At a party once, everyone was so careful that only I cut my lip drinking from the winter spring, a kind of cold decorative trough centerpiece we were all drinking from. The idea is you're like animals. 
If you ask about the cut, why me? The answer is, of course me. In what world ever possible, not me? I could admit that with open blood running down my chin like hyena butter or gasoline. I was mortified, really lost. After that, I thought, I, I have to meet someone. <laughs> I'm dreaming of a house just like this one, but larger and opener to the trees. Nighter than day and higher than noon, and you visiting, knocking to get in, hoping for icy milk or hot tea or whatever it is you like. For each night is a long drink in a short glass, a drink of black sound water, such a rush and fall of lonesome, no form can contain it. And if it isn't night yet, though I seem to recall that it is, then it is not for everyone. Did you receive my invitation? It is not for everyone. Please come to my house lit by leaf light. It's like a book with bright pages filled with flocks and glens and groves and overlooked by a pan, that seductive satyr in whom the fish is also cooked. A book that took too long to read, but minutes to unread, that is, to forget. Strange are the pages thus, nothing but the hope of company. I made too much pie in expectation. I was hoping to sit with you in a tree house, in a nightgown, in a real way. Did you receive my invitation? Written in haste, before leaf blinked out, before the idea fully formed, an idea like a storm cloud that does not spill or arrive, but moves silently in a direction like a dark book in a long life, with a vague hope in a wood house with an open door. And I'll finish with a poem called Noctroclocite, which is, you know, just a common household word. <laughs> it's um, Kakaja Silverman's beautiful um, book of psychoanalytic theory called Flesh of My Flesh. It's, it's knockout. Noctroclocite's a Freudian term. It's, uh, it's sort of a, um, analogous to post-traumatic stress. Noctroclocite. On having slashed myself from throat to instep in one unbroken line, I suppose it was a reenactment. Freud's Noctroclocite, the second act. The past presses so hard on the present, the present is badly bruised. Blood brims under the skin. That was the situation I was in. Wearing a jacket of blood from an earlier crime, which was also mine. A curving zipper with misaligned teeth, open to show red lipstick, meat, and a stage smile, have a seat. Normally, I'm much more careful. Naturally, something like this would only ever happen in a dream. But even dreams have their dream have their, even dreams have their dreams of finding their dreamer awake, silent with an earshot, carving knife in hand. Did you know that anguish thins the blood and thickens the vessel? It was like cutting a rare steak, a minotaur glittering with rubies and pink candles. My hands hung like electrical wires off a building on the edge of collapse, every one of my gestures symbolic, ruined of magic. For there is no miraculous beast, and there never was, standing on the golden field of frozen honey clover, each leaf strong enough to bend under everything's weight, strong because it bends, because it has already been crushed, but its cells know that blight, one massive cut, will slit each tiny skin surgically in order to save the field from itself. I cannot suffer the same fate twice, Force my own hand or stay it. Can't repeat or unrepeat. This finitude is infinite and infinitely expanding. Thank you. <laughs>